Closing keynote speaker, um, Dr. Janine Austin, and she is a professor in psychiatry and medical genetics at the UBC in Vancouver. And I know that she needs no introduction to this group, but I am going to do one anyway for several reasons. Number one, she's awesome. And I think it's always really reinforcing, particularly when we have a topic like this, to remind ourselves why we have chosen this particular speaker. Um, I really enjoyed being able to go back through her, her accomplishments, I think, to, to think about what I wanted to say about her. They, I'm sorry, they. Um, and also because it's really unusual for an organizing committee to choose a member of our organizing committee to be a speaker. So I want to make it really clear why it was important to have them as the speaker for this session. So Janine is a board certified genetic counselor. They received their PhD in neuropsychiatric genetics from the University of Wales and then received their master's in genetic counseling from UBC. And brilliantly combining both of their degrees, their research work involves studying the impact of genetic counseling for people with psychiatric disorders and their families. Janine is truly one of the most accomplished and inspiring genetic counselor researchers that I know. And in my mind, they are the epitome of an academic genetic counselor, which is why this is the perfect talk for them. One of the first times we ever worked together was on the Jane Engelberg Memorial Foundation Advisory Board. We were talking about this last night. And um, I think that was really one of the times when I got to understand Janine's impact as a researcher. Uh, they have published, I think, about 200 research papers. It's amazing. I couldn't come up with an exact number. Um, they will be exciting their exciting new role as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Genetic Counseling in January of 2024, as you know. So with that, I hope you will join me in welcoming our final speaker, Dr. Janine Austin. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was really lovely. Um, and thank you all for like bearing with me. I, I'm really excited, actually, at the opportunity to wrap up this. What has actually been really awesome as a couple of days, I've really enjoyed everybody's presentations. So yeah, um, I'm going to start just by, so as you will have noticed, there's been a few of us that have been doing land acknowledgements. I think it's a lovely thing to see. Um, so for me, I'm a settler in the traditional, ancestral, and importantly, unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, and that includes the Musqueam, the Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I'm very grateful to the peoples who've always called those lands home um, for their generosity in sharing it with me and stewardship um, of that land too. So this is actually relevant to what I want to present to you about today, um, because the way that I think and speak about the topics that I'm going to talk about um, have actually been really influenced by my learning about the history, culture, and ways of knowing um, of these peoples that I've just mentioned. And I hope that I'm able to show you um, some of the ways in which this learning has shaped my thinking as I present for you today. Disclosures. So you already heard about the... <laughs> I will eventually receive a stipend. I haven't had one yet, but I will get one um, associated with my role of, of editor-in-chief. And that is a Wiley journal, and that's relevant in terms of disclosures, and I'll show you... Uh, that will become clear at the end. And I have also provided consulting services to 20, 23andMe. Cool. Okay. So you heard about why I was invited to do this, and it, thank you, Kelly, for that, because it does feel a bit awkward as being a member of the committee and then coming up to present... Um, but and, and um, but so I was asked about what my exact title was going to be, and so I proposed this one. Um, but when I actually sat down to think about what it meant, I realised that I didn't actually really know what an academic discipline was. So that's the first thing that we're going to talk about, and then we're going to talk about why establishing genetic counselling as an academic discipline matters. And then once we've done that, hopefully I'm going to convince you that it's really important. We've got to do it. And then I'm going to talk about how we do that and what we can all do to contribute. So let's start at the beginning. What do I even mean by academic discipline? So you heard earlier Alison saying that um, in Australia and New Zealand, academic discipline can mean school or a subcomponent of a department. That's not what I mean here. But as I said, it wasn't clear. So I did what any of us would do when we don't know what exactly something means, at least if you're a Gen X, so you go to Wikipedia. Um, and then my partner was like, that's not what the kids are doing now. You've got to go to chat GPT. <laughs> so <laughs> I put it into chat GPT and that's what it told me. It said, an academic discipline is a specific field of study or branch of knowledge that is taught and researched at academic ins uh, ins educational institutions such as universities and colleges. 
Academic disciplines are organised around a particular subject matter and have their own established methodologies, theories and bodies of knowledge. These disciplines help individuals to specialise in specific areas and contribute to the advancement of their chosen field. And I was like, okay, yeah, that kind of gets at the things I want to talk about, I guess. But words mean things, right? We're genetic counsellors and words matter to us. And I realised that while this gets at the concept that I wanted to talk about, I actually really don't like the term academic discipline. Um, discipline as a word in particular makes me think of control and punishment and cis-heteronormative, ableist, patriarchal, colonialism stuff. So nothing that I really want to support and propagate and, you know, sort of contribute to. So I went down a little bit of a first rabbit hole. I'm sorry, you're going to hear about lots of rabbit holes today, so bear with me. But the first one I went down was like, well, okay, if, we, if, if I don't want to talk about disciplines, what should I talk about then? Um, and I came across the idea that women's studies was very purposefully named. It chose its name so as to remain undisciplined, precisely because they didn't like the concept of discipline, which I thought was brilliant. So it's a, that's a principled stance to take for sure. But I'm not sure, but it comes with drawbacks as well. I mean, we, can, we all know how well respected women's studies is in, in academic circles, not very, right? So, so that's the price that you pay. So, okay, disciplines are, so, um, <laughs> so I was talking to Kennedy Borley and she introduced me to the concept of post-disciplinarity. So I'm going to share with you a quote about post-disciplinarity right now and I, I don't want you to panic, okay? I did a practice run through of this talk and I some sort of saw a member of my audience literally just go, oh God, so don't, don't worry, okay? But I'm going to share it with you because I want you to see just how far down the rabbit hole I mentioned I went. Okay, this is about post bliss. <laughs> I haven't even read it to you yet, Kelly. Complexity can be read in the relatively canonical taxonomy of these concepts that structure epistemological reflections on the dynamics of knowledge production lying between and beyond disciplinary boundaries. Clear? <laughs> so I read this like eight times and still came away none the wiser. Um, so, I mean, it's all very fancy sounding words, but I've got no idea what it actually means. Um, so I did what I usually do in situations where I get completely overwhelmed, which is that I gave up entirely and <laughs> went back to the beginning. So what I had established was that I wanted to talk about we need to make sure that genetic counselling research is respected and so on. That's what I meant. But now I'd ended up down this rabbit hole of like disciplines and all this kind of rubbish. And I was like, no, 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 no. Let's just reappraise. What am I trying to say here? So this is what I decided that I wanted to say. I want to talk about establishing genetic counselling as a legitimate area or field of study that has academic credibility. Okay. And academic credibility. So I'm talking here. I'm talking about like um, recognised by academic institutions, recognised in sort of you know, the, those nasty colonial, hierarchical, patriarchal environments of universities that I was just talking about, but having the respect and acknowledgement of the, the value of our work in those spaces, okay? So, let's start again. I'm going to talk with you about unlocking the next phase of development for our profession, and that's about establishing genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility. Good. So, now we know what we're talking about. Let's talk about why it matters. So I think there are several different interrelated areas at which it matters that we do this. It matters at the level of the profession of genetic counselling. It matters at the level of society and the patient. And it also matters at the level of the individual genetic counsellor. But let's start with the profession. So I hope this is obvious, but I'm just going to like really drum it home. Um, so for the profession and practice of genetic counselling, it matters that we establish um, genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility because our credibility as a clinical profession depends on evidence. As we've heard throughout this conference, people have alluded to evidence-based medicine being super important and it's recognised that you know any interventions we deliver should be based on evidence. That includes genetic counselling. We should be doing evidence-based work. So evidence underpins our ability to con continue to advance and consolidate our positions as leaders in the implementation of genomic medicine in those places in the world where we've already established ourselves as a profession and in those areas in the world where we have not yet managed to do that. And we heard some brilliant talks about that yesterday. 
um, then evidence research is absolutely critical to establishing genetic counselling as a profession. We need evidence about the value of what we do to help further those agendas. So, it, yeah, it matters to our profession. It also matters for society and for patients. So, because obviously we're best able to help patients clinically and to contribute meaningfully to society when what we do is guided by research evidence, right? So, I'm going to take this further and say that the future of our services being available to patients actually depends on research generating evidence to guide and support what we do, okay? Um, and as I was preparing to talk about this stuff with you today, um, I actually found um, the, the address that I wrote to be incoming president of NSGC, and it was a bunch of years ago, 2015. But I found this thing that I'd written, and I quite liked it, and I thought I'd share it again. So I'd said that allowing the extinction of our profession would be a profound disservice to the patients and future potential patients who stand to benefit from our unique skill set and perspective. So I think that's really true. Um, but, you know, so context, we already know, all of us, that there's people out there going, oh, well, there's not really enough genetic counsellors, so let's not, you know, let's just train other people to do this stuff. And the problem is with that, that, um, you know, while I think we should be training other professionals to do elements of what we do, there are things that we do that just cannot be systematically outsourced to other people. So without doing a disservice to our patients, at least, the counselling part of what we do is something that we can do best. Um, other professions who are skilled in counselling just don't have the genetics background and professions skilled in genetics don't have the same philosophical approach to things that we have. I mean, we have more in common with midwifery than we do with clinical genetics in terms of our underpinnings and how we think about things. Um, so, yeah, I think this unique combination of things um, is, of, is of huge value to our patients. So, so, yeah, we need research in order to sustain our profession so that we can continue contributing to society and helping our patients. <laughs> Finally, it also matters at the level of the individual genetic counsellor that we establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility. It matters particularly for people like me who are in tenure stream research positions. And you may be thinking, oh, well, I'm not going to listen to this bit because there's so few genetic counsellors in positions like that, it doesn't really matter. So if that's you then, and, and you're thinking, who cares? Okay, that's fine. But um, I'm a big believer in the idea that when one of us succeeds, we all collectively succeed and that we should be elevating and promoting and supporting each other in achieving and contributing in, a, in the specific areas that, that we are uniquely placed to do. So, um, yeah, I think it helps our patients ultimately when we have um, members of our profession moving through academic faculty ranks. So, um, yeah, so that uh, what we're seeing, we were just having a conversation outside before coming in about how the number of genetic counsellors moving into academic or tenure stream research based faculty positions is increasing. Um, and when you're in these kinds of roles, promotion and advancement is tied directly to the recognition of the value of the work that you do. What I'm showing you right now is a real life review of, <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at some of the faces. And <laughs> Do you like all the angry purple arrows pointing? <laughs> so uh, this was actually one of my grant applications. It was for a renewal of my Canada research chair, which is a super prestigious thing that I got a while back. And um, so I had to submit this big proposal about what I was going to do. My reviewer, this was reviewer number four, wrote two lines, and this was one of them. I think that her work is not really science, but mostly propaganda and academic politics. So if that doesn't tell you that genetic counselling research is not recognised as an academic legitimate field of study with academic credibility, I don't know what to tell you, right? But that's fairly, <laughs> it's fairly blindingly, um, you know, apparent right there. So this has affected me in other ways too. Um, I was denied promotion to full professor the first time I tried because the reviewers didn't recognise the value of the work that I was doing. So because when you're going for promotion to full professor, you need people who are already at that rank to review you. And they have to be in research-based tenure stream positions. And there really wasn't very many people within the genetic counselling community that could review my portfolio. So it ended up being reviewed by people outside of my field. And they were like, meh, whatever. Don't know what that is. So, um, <laughs> and another thing I want to point out is that I know that you know, many of you might know me as a genetic counselling researcher, which is cool. 
But I want you to know that I've never actually had any of my genetic counselling research funded by a Canadian federal research agency. I've had my basic science funded by those agencies, and I've had my genetic counselling research funded elsewhere, but I've not had any of it funded through. And that's a problem, because if we're going to generate this evidence, which is going to help our patients, is going to help our profession, we can't do that without funding. And so if these funding agencies don't recognise us as a legitimate profession, um, area of study, problems. Not just for the individual genetic counsellor like me, but for all those other layers we talked about too. I do want to point out that my colleague Alison Elliott has had success at the federal level in Canada with her Gen Council project, which was actually the largest genetic counselling research project ever funded anywhere in the world. Um, so she got $4.6 million for that, which is awesome. So it tells us that there is progress being made. And NIH recently had a genetic counselor specific um, grant competition and that sort of thing. So progress is happening, but it really does matter. I hope I've... Okay, maybe I'll stop banging on about that. But you get the idea. <laughs> Good, okay, so have I convinced you yet? Do I need to say anything else about why it matters? Okay, okay, there's thumbs up at the back, good. So um, if you're with me that this matters, then we need to talk about how. How do we make this happen? How do we establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study that has this academic credibility? Okay, so when I got to thinking about this part, I was like, okay, that's easy, no problem. We conduct and publish high quality genetic counselling research and then we make sure that it's being shared with and read by people, genetic counsellors obviously, but also people other than genetic counsellors. Done. Bye. See you later. <laughs> but then I realised, no, but, but how do we actually, how do we and others recognise or define what is genetic counselling research? <sighs> so more rabbit holes. Sorry, everyone. So. Okay, so, so let's try and figure out what genetic counselling research is. That's the next part of this, okay? So when I started thinking about this, I was laying out different ideas for myself about different potential ways in which we could think about defining this. So I'm going to run through them with you. What about any research that's conducted by a genetic counsellor? Sounds kind of reasonable, except that, as I told you, I do a whole bunch of molecular work. I'm a genetic counsellor. I don't think of that as genetic counselling research. So I was like... No, not that. Also, it would rule out genetic counselling research, what we could classify as genetic counselling research that's not done by a genetic counsellor. So I didn't like this. Immediate reject. What about research that is about genetic counsellors? Because all we know that genetic counsellors love studying ourselves. Um, <laughs> but clearly that's not, that doesn't define the limits of genetic counselling research. It would be a piece of. What about genetic, is genetic counselling research anything that is about genetic counselling? And this felt initially a bit closer, but I also felt that maybe it was a bit too narrow because there's more to genetic counselling research than just thinking about process and outcomes. All those things are really important, but there's more to it than just that. And I didn't feel that that would capture the full range of things. You heard when I asked Jack, chat GPT about what an academic discipline was, it said that there were, it was often defined by the use of a particular method or approach. So I toyed with that idea. What is, can we recognise genetic counselling research th this way? But I hated that immediately because I, I use both qualitative and quantitative, for example, and they're both incredibly valuable. And the idea of losing one or other of them is just not tolerable. So I rejected that one immediately. <laughs> What about research that has a particular goal? So this one I hummed and hawed about for a while, um, but basically ended up feeling like in order for the goal to capture everything that I think it should, it would have to be so broad as to essentially be meaningless. So I kind of rejected that one, which left me with this one. Could we recognise or define genetic counselling research as any research that's defined by some sort of central worldview? And I kind of got a bit stuck on that one because I thought maybe this, this might make sense, but I don't really know what that would be. Okay, so I'm literally taking you on my journey of thinking. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but yeah. So where I ended up was, okay, so if we can define genetic counselling research by stuff that, ha by being defined by a central worldview, then, oh gosh, we can't define genetic counselling research without first defining genetic counselling and articulating its core values and assumptions. Are you with me? I know this is like with so many onion layers in right now, but okay, I think there's some general nods. Okay, cool. So 
<laughs> let's just reorient. So the purpose of this whole thing is supposed to be about establishing gen genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study of, with academic credibility. So we've talked about why that matters, and now we're trying to talk about how we achieve this, but so many layers in, because we've got to try and figure out what it even is first, okay? So defining genetic counselling and its core values and assumptions. I started wondering whether this was taking things too far, but then I found, actually, again, this was a, um, given to me by Kennedy Borley, and it's actually from m nursing. Um, but, and I love this quote, um, and the QR code will take you directly to the paper that this comes from if you're interested in any of this. Um, but it does matter that we define these things. So this author says that without a clear disciplinary, and she uses disciplinary, but we'll let that slide here, that's fine disciplinary orientation and foundation to guide the development of the profession, it's easy to lose the way. The nursing profession, without the disciplinary foundation for knowledge and practice, can easily be guided by a hospital culture and pressure to conform to a medicalized, clinicalized view of humanity. Right? If you replace the word nursing profession with genetic counseling profession, I think that reson it resonates with me. And, you know, so we've heard at this conference, for example, Noor talk the other day about how genetic counselling um, positions are not being created based on evidence about what helps patients. They're being created based on demand for genetic testing that's driven by physicians, right? So if we want to talk about medicalised, clinicalised views of humanity and the reduction of our roles to simply the delivery of genetic testing, that's what's happening. Right? So this feels urgent to me. This feels urgent that we, that we define who it is that we are, what it is that we do, why that matters, and generate evidence for it. I would also like to say that I think it's important um, that this is, I love this conference because it's international, right? This is the World Congress on Genetic Counseling. And I think that if we're talking about definitions and core values and assumptions, I think they should ideally be things that transcend you know, country-related geographical boundaries. So nursing is nursing is nursing, no matter where you are in the world. And it would be awesome if we could come up with some stuff for genetic counselling that has the same sort of cohesion to it, um, to give us a sense of strong sense of identity and community. So, okay. So I'm going to start not with defining genetic counselling, and the reason I'm not going to start with that is because I thought it would be easy. So we'll deal with the easy thing second, right? I'm going to deal with the core values and assumptions first. So I started wondering, does genetic counselling have core values and assumptions? And I'm going to say, yes, we absolutely do. But I think the problem is, like, if I were to ask everybody around the room, you would probably come up with different things. And that's because we haven't, like, clearly articulated them anywhere particularly for ourselves or for anybody else. And I think that's because of the history of where we come from. And if you're interested in, like, I had this mass on the thing that used to be called Twitter, which I won't use anymore, so that QR code will take you to a thread. Um, it's like a little, you know, script thingy of all the tweets that is not on Twitter, so it's accessible to anyone. Um, but, but basically, so if you're interested in this concept, there's more on that thread. But Genetic counselling as a discipline, as a, as a profession, I'm sorry, emerged in the United States um, and it was founded by cis, het, middle class to upper class, white women, right? At a time when professional environments like that weren't particularly welcoming to women. And so I think that this failure that we have exhibited to own our values and that sort of thing probably comes from that, right? That we're just trying to squeeze in and don't mind us and like we don't want to offend anybody or tread on any toes and so we're just sort of very politely and gently trying to squeeze in around the edges. But that time is gone now. Like we really need to own who we are and what we do. Um, so yeah, um, I think that's just an important backgrounder to this. Okay, so... Does genetic counselling have core values and assumptions? And you'll notice the asterisk there about, um, around genetic counselling because the words genetic counselling can actually get used two ways. They often get used to talk about the activity that we might engage in or that other people might engage in, where you sit down with a patient and usually it's, you know, people think about talking about genetic testing, right? So the activity of genetic counselling. But genetic counselling is also a profession, and that's what I'm interested in thinking about core values and assumptions and that sort of thing. So the three papers at the bottom there 
Um, so I'm sure you're all intimately familiar with the reciprocal engagement model, uh, Pat McCarthy, Veach, and everybody else. So that's the one on the left. Um, so that actually outlines central tenets of genetic counselling. Okay. So you'll notice I'm not using the word tenets, and that's on purpose, because again, as I said at the beginning, words mean things. And tenet is one of those words that I've found in my role at the journal is often profoundly misused and misunderstood. We often say tenant, tenant, like, you know, a, a, a renter, you know? And, and it's not like, so tenet actually means principles or beliefs. Um, and so, but as I was thinking about this, I realized that actually some of the things might be assumptions, so things that we believe to be true about the world, and other elements are actually not so much not so much things that we believe to be true, but things that we we prize, characteristics or things that we value we value, right? So our core values, things that we want to prioritize in how we behave. Okay? So I've I've tried to separate them out um, because I thought it might be useful, but as I go through these, I probably will again find myself disagreeing with myself. So I'm just like throwing them up there for you to react to, basically. Um, and the third one is, I was delighted to find the QR code on Sasha's poster outside um, that took me to the work that the um, AGNC has been doing. And so there's, you're going to see some of these issues come up in the next couple of minutes. Okay, so foundational assumptions, first of all. I don't think you can be a genetic counsellor without believing that genetic information has value as a fundamental truth. All right? I'm not going to belabor that because I think that's kind of obvious. It's in purple because this is something that has been previously identified as a core, va core value or foundational assumption or something of genetic counselling by those two papers there at the bottom. Words have meaning and we need to use them carefully. This one's in grey because I <coughs> pulled it out of my ass, I think is what I want to say. Um, but, but not really because um, if, when you think about what you learned in your genetic counselling training programmes, we learn things like when you're talking to a patient, you don't talk about risk for something. You know, you should talk about it as a chance. You don't talk about mutations, you talk about variations, right? So we think about the emotional impact that our words can have and how they land with people. Think about how I talked to you for the first five minutes about discipline because I hated the idea of control and punishment, right? So words mean things and we, and we need to use them carefully. I do think that, I do think this is, a, this is a foundational assumption that we have as a field. So I'm just going to propose that out there for us. Number three, humans are not purely logical beings. Emotions matter. And again, this has previously been identified by um, Pat and by Bob Biesica. Um, so yeah, maybe different words in the way that they articulated it, but the concept is the same. And relatedly, patients or clients are capable and resilient, but we all need support sometimes. Right? So these things are related. And, and again, that's in purple because previously identified. Okay? So those are things, again, I'm, I'm proposing are things that we believe to be true. Right? Now let's get into values. The first one I'm going to put up is person-centeredness. And if you've looked at the reciprocal engagement model, the figure literally has the patient in the middle. Like, it's patient-centered. Right? That, that's what we do. That's something that we value. Relationships matter also in purple because previously identified. However, the relationships that have been emphasized in these previous two papers are the ones between the patient and the counselor. And yes, that relationship matters deeply, but I think that the, as genetic counselors, we also recognize that the patients external to the counseling relationship matter. So, you know, if I'm making a healthcare decision, for example, um, you know, whether to go for mam mammography, for example. I don't make that decision on my own. I make it with my partner, you know. So I don't want to go. She does. She wants me to go because I should. Um, so we discuss it together, you know, like, so we recognize that as genetic counselors, that you're not making your decisions on your own as an island. You, you have relationships with family and community that, that influence things. Clear communication. And um, Sasha, wherever you are, thank you so much. Um, because I got to put this one in blue because it's also in the AGNC document and I loved it. Thank you. Um, so we value clear communication. Again, that relates to the words have meaning piece, but it also relates to the fact that we want to try to make sure that everybody can benefit from what we have to offer. We try to um, ensure that we're using interpreters. We try and make sure things are accessible to people, right? So um, I think we really do value co clear communication. Okay. 
another one that's in blue. This isn't highlighted anywhere else, that, not explicitly um, in any of these two previous documents, but it's definitely been coming to the fore over recent years within the genetic counselling profession, and I was delighted to see it on the AGNC um, document as well. Um, this, this attention to inclusion, equity and justice. We think, you know, so historically, and I'm just going to be really blunt, um, genetic counselling as an intervention is something that's really been delivered mostly to cishet middle-class white women, and that's not cool. Um, you know, we have increasingly, I think, realised that we need to do better than that and that, that there are so many people that could benefit from what we have to offer. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to put that as a proposed value. And then finally, um, I think one of the things that holds us all together in terms of values is that we believe that individuals should have rights to make informed and relationally autonomous decisions. So when I'm saying autonomous here, I'm, I'm caveating it with relational because, again, in recognition that we're not making decisions on our own in isolation, relational autonomy is critical. So yeah, maybe we can chat about that a little bit at the end, um, but I'm going to leave that there for a second and talk for a moment about something that was not on that previous slide, okay? It was not a mistake, it was very purposeful, and if I never, ever, 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 ever have to hear the words non-directiveness again, it will be too soon. Can we please relegate this term to the dustbin of history immediately? Thank you. And there's a couple of reasons I feel so. So there's been so many people who have written so many amazing things about why this term is so useless. I don't understand why it persists. I genuinely do not. Okay, throw it away. One of the reasons I hate it is because words have meaning, as we've discussed, and there is no universally understood meaning of this term. It lacks any sort of definitional clarity, which means that then people try and operationalize it in ways that can actively cause harm. So the best example of that would be if you're trying to be non-directive, whatever that is, and a patient says, well, what should I do? You go, well, I can't tell you what to do. That's your decision. And if all these things that we just talked about on this previous slide, Matt, like, that is not upholding any of those values. It's not, right? So I hate it. Can you tell at all? <laughs> also, we cannot, we are not, and we, ca we shouldn't try to be neutral purveyors of information. This is another way that non-directiveness often gets thought about. Um, but again, we can't embody our core values and assumptions if I'm just trying to be like a textbook, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. So. Um, yeah, let's, let's please bin that phrase. Awesome. Good. So, so um, we've talked then about, about defining the core values of genetic counselling. And remember, this is all in an effort to try and figure out how we establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility. So I said that I was going to do the core values and assumptions first because I thought the definition of genetic counselling would be easy. So let's do that then, shall we? Okay. I was like, yeah, this is dead easy. There's a, there's a definition of genetic counselling. Hooray! It's this one. I'm sure you can all repeat it, wrote with me, if you like. But so, um, but as I sat and looked at this again, anew, like with fresh eyes, if you like, I started getting a bit worried about this because I realised that it doesn't actually describe anything about our core values and how we engage in the work and... So I actually realised that I think this definition is more about the activity of genetic counselling than it is about the profession of genetic counselling. And that's not actually what we need right now. We need something that defines who we are as a profession, not, not what people do when they're engaging with this stuff, who are anybody, right? So I had, so I, you know, and, uh, the, the other problem is, I'm just going to say something that we all know, right? So... When you're talking to somebody, it happened to me the other day in a cab on the way here, the guy was like, what do you do? I'm like a genetic counsellor, what's that? Right? And every, I don't know about you, but every time somebody asks me what's that, I kind of, ugh. Because I never quite know what to say, but I can tell you what I don't do. I don't rattle that off. It's not a, it's not a party thing that you're going to say to people. So anyway, I had an experience recently where I'd had, I was doing a media interview and um, the guy I was talking to, I'd so enjoyed the conversation with him. Like, he was asking awesome questions. And um, so he actually, he asked me the question, what is genetic counselling? And instead of, like, rattling off something rote 
or kind of rolling my eyes and not really. I actually tried to really engage with the question. And um, what came out of my mouth was like, oh my God, I quite like that. So I'm going to share it with you, okay? Um, I have edited it a little bit since. And um, so here's what I came up with. Genetic counselling as a profession, not an activity, is, and this is the edited bit, a psychotherapeutic interaction aimed at helping people to make meaning of genetic information and helping them use that information in alignment with their values, needs and wants to manage their health in the context of uncertainty. So I like this because to me, it's trying to get at, um, you know, in the alignment with their values, needs and wants, it's talking about some of our values, that things, things that we want to prioritize and care about. And it talks about what we're ultimately trying to achieve. It's not just helping people understand for understanding's sake. It's, it's so that they can do something with that understanding, that they can manage their health. Okay? So I'm just, I'm just putting this up here for you to react to, essentially. Okay? So that's, that's that. So where does that leave us? So what we've talked about is that to establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility, we need to conduct and publish high quality genetic counselling research and ensure that this is being shared with and read by people other than genetic counsellors. I've tried to make the case that genetic counselling research can't be defined by who does it, methods used or goals, but instead we might, to try and recognise and define genetic counselling research, we need to define genetic counselling as a profession and its foundational assumptions and core values. And that's what I've been trying to sort of, you know, get us towards. So. Again, I have to thank Kennedy Borley. She's been um, finding some awesome papers as I've been going through the process of trying to figure out what I'm talking about here. Um, so in thinking about how genetic counselling research should not be defined by the use of specific methods or approaches and how it doesn't need a single goal. Um, so this is, this is something that she gave me and I really liked it. So the QR code is actually gonna take you to a paper that is about defining health services research. And I've adapted that definition um, to make it applicable to genetic counselling. So again, this is just me like throwing stuff out there and you know, for us to discuss. So genetic counselling research is an area of study that's rooted in a core set of values and assumptions that pragmatically applies a variety of paradigms to examine need for, access to, and the use, costs, quality, delivery, organisation, financing, and outcomes of genetic counselling services to produce new knowledge about the structure, processes, and effects of genetic counselling for individuals and populations. So I want to draw your attention to the piece about pragmatically applies, blah, 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 right? That, that is absolutely explicitly rejecting the idea that, that we can define genetic counselling research by a particular method or approach, um, that, that it encompasses all sorts of different things, it all fits. Um, yeah, and, and then it's sort of all anchored on the core values and assumptions piece. So yeah, I, I think it really matters like in terms of um, that we don't just think of good quality research as being about randomised control trials, for example. <laughs> they're, they're awesome, but so are qualitative studies. Like there's room for everything and it all adds value. Okay, so. Have I lost everybody at this point? No, oh, okay. <laughs> I lost myself, so I wouldn't be surprised. Um, <laughs> but um, okay, so so I'm going to just I'm going to press on bravely, and I'm going to assume that you're all with me, and that we've established that this is an important thing to do. That we do need to establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility, and I'm going to talk about what we can all do to help achieve this. Okay, so if we're going to do this, conducting and publishing high quality genetic counselling research and sharing it with people other than just us, there's things that each of us can do. We can all contribute to this in different ways. I'm going to start with, um, um, did you see that fly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was the one that was bugging somebody else the other day. Probably. Anyway, um, so I'm going to start with a group of people that's largely people in this room, like the established researchers. What can we do? The obvious thing, of course, is that we need to have high standards in designing and conducting your research. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. This is what you're already doing. Um, so, but, but it's important and it needs to be said, right? And so obviously high standards are gonna, um, you know, it's knowing what the standards are for. <coughs> yeah, it, no, it is a fly, it's not a wasp or anything, good. Um, so 
so it's about knowing what the high standards are. Like high standards for qualitative research are different than the high standards for RCTs, for example. So it's just knowing what they are and applying those things. Of course, sharing your fantastic papers really matters. Um, and I'm going to talk about this just for a minute, okay? So um, the, the QR code there is going to take you to a recent publication that's talking about some of the difficulties and problems with academic publishing systems. So and when I'm saying share your fab papers, if the idea is that we want to establish genetic counselling as a credible, legitimate discipline, that means we need to be publishing our stuff in credible, legitimate sources, right? So, and um, there's actually some publishing houses that have been identified as being quite problematic in terms of like predatory practices and that sort of thing. Um, and to the point where some institutions actually don't count um, any manuscripts that researchers publish in journals published by those publishing houses because they're so problematic. So um, those, those publishing houses include MDPI, Frontiers, and Hindawi. And I want you to know that this is not a scold. I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you've ever published there, because if I was saying that, I would be a bad person. Because, you know, I, I've, I've also done this. So this is not a scold. It's just um, an awareness thing that, you know, if, if this is our goal, that we want this credibility, then we have to be mindful of, of these places that we're publishing. Um, yeah, so, um, and then I think another role for us as established researchers is, and we heard about this, thank you, Alison, for your talk earlier, it was so beautiful, about like mentoring, teaching, and supporting others. This is absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. Um, <laughs> conflict of interest, anyone? Um, yeah, so um, reviewing manuscripts, right? That's it's so important. Like, um, so if you're an established researcher that has not been engaged, with um, reviewing manuscripts for, for example, the Journal of Genetic Counseling, but you would like to, do let me know and I'll hook you up. Um, yeah, so, but, but it's really important to help other researchers ensure that the papers that they're publishing are of the highest possible quality. So this is really something that we can all contribute to if we're established in this space. And then considering our citation practices. I mean, this piece really upsets me every time I think about it in a couple of ways. We know like, that papers that have female named first and last authors tend to be cited a lot less frequently than papers that have male first and or last authors. It's, it's horrible. And there's been tons of research about this in all sorts of different disciplines. And so it holds, it holds researchers back, it holds fields back. So another story. So I, I, I work in psychiatric genetics, and the number of papers that I've been working on that are more sort of like on the molecular side, and the, the writing team will put in some blah blah about, and this might have implications for clinical practice. And then I'm like, oh my god, people, there's an entire body of research about this. You don't just write that sentence and then leave it uncited. Like, you have to, like, cite the stuff. Cite the stuff. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's critically important that we as a field like acknowledge the work that we're building on. And especially for those of us that are working, like if you're in a cardiology group and writing a paper, cite genetic counselling research in, in what you're doing, if it's relevant, obviously. Um, so yeah, this, this really matters. As you can tell, I'm like yelling at you all, yes. Um, <laughs> okay, so what about if you're not established yet? What about if you're emerging as a researcher? What can you do to contribute to this mission of establishing genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study? Find those expert mentors. I'm literally going to put my hand up right here. One of the, my favouritest things in the universe is helping mentor and support uh, people who are beginning their research. It's like my favourite thing. It's so fun to watch people you know, fall in love with the research process and find out what they can do and that sort of thing. And I know I'm not the only one. I know that you can often feel like a burden on others if you're a trainee or something and you don't want to bother others, but it's not, a, it's not a burden, not for me and not for others. So yeah, so, so don't hesitate to reach out and learn as much as you can. Um, so one of the things I'm seeing um, as I start handling papers at the Journal of Genetic Counseling is that um, you know, people are often, like, when we begin our research careers, I think there's a tendency to, um, you know, t treat research as like um, a recipe, that you do the how part, you do the step-by-step, -step, well, I do this, and then I do that, and then I do the other thing. 
But it's also really important to understand why. Like, what are the philosophical underpinnings around why you do each step? Because if you, if you don't understand the philosophical underpinnings, you can end up doing methods that are kind of internally inconsistent. You know, um, so I think for emerging researchers, it's really important. I love the cheering on from the side there. Thank you. Um, so to learn as much as you can, not just about how to do the research, but why. Like, what, what's the epistemological, ontological stuff underlying all of the things that we're doing? Um, yeah. OK, so this is a note for emerging researchers, because there's stuff that happens. Once you publish your first academic paper, you start getting inundated with a new kind of spam. And again, the point is that we want to establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility. And we don't get those things if we fall for scams and spam. Right? So I'm just going to point out a couple of different ways in which you get scammed and spammed. Okay, so this, this is a, just, just one, one of the dozens a day, I'm not even joking, that I get. Um, this is one from last week. And the reason, the, one of the ways in which this is a giveaway is spam is that um, it's the Journal of Surgical Oncology, right? And they want me to submit a paper about a previous piece of work I'd done, which was about autistic adults' perspectives on genetic testing for autism. Like, <laughs> do you know what? Yes, good, thank you, that's the right reaction. Yeah, so, so that, that, that is a giveaway. So if you're an emerging researcher and you start getting these kinds of invitations, it can feel really good. It can feel like super flattering and you're like, oh, they want me to do this stuff. Um, but check with your mentors first. You don't want to miss out on legit opportunities, but you also don't want to fall for stuff like this. So check with your mentors. And then you don't just get invitations to write manuscripts. You also get invitations to go to meetings. And I have my very favorite ever, ever invitation. I'm going to read it to you because it's that good. Hi, Dr. Austin. We messaged. We sent emails. We tried to call you, but all in vain. <laughs> Our only intention was to make you aware of the growth you will get in your career after adding valuable conference in your CV. All we ever wanted was for you to attend the second edition conference on nursing, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't understand why you were delaying the process. Well, we respect your decision, but honestly, you have no idea what opportunity you are leaving on the table. Two years from now, you will realize and maybe wish, if you could have, Still, if you change your mind, if you do not procrastinate this time. <laughs> now, if you're wondering, yes, it is two years from when I got that, and do I regret my life choices? <laughs> no, no, I do not. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed that as much as I did, yeah. Um, cool, anyway. So um, the last group I want to briefly talk about is educators. So for those of you in the room who have a role in genetic counseling training programs, we need you. You have such an important role to play here. Like, I'm, like, and if there's anything I can do personally to help support you in that, like, I will. Like, let me know. Seriously. Um, so the first thing I think that as educators we can do is ensuring that your trainees have quality research supervision. So people who will actually actively engage with your trainees and help them understand not just the what, but the how and the why and you know, help them through that process so that they enjoy research, um, not just as something that they have to get through to get, get out of their program. You know? Research methods education. Like, so if you've got room in your curriculum for some, for some like, um, yeah, a, a research methods classes about qualitative different approaches to quantitative, et cetera, awesome. <laughs> And then the last thing I think is quality, quality journal club discussions. So I think, you know, we all have journal clubs and I think a lot of the time they end up being a bit rote. You know, you kind of show up, you do some half-assed, like you look at their limitations and you go, yeah, there's limitations. But like, you know, if you, <laughs> so, okay, that resonated with people. But I think you can actually have, like with a skilled facilitator, these can be really valuable in helping um, trainees to figure out like the whys of why we do things, right? So I think there is room for that to be really good. Okay, just to wrap up. So um, if you need, if you want some like guidance, I've just got a couple of really great resources to share with you in closing, right? So th th this is for people who are interested in studying the outcomes of genetic counseling, right? This is one piece of the puzzle, right? This is the, uh, a website that was created by Heather Zierhut and Debbie Cragen, and it's absolutely awesome. It includes and the QR code will take you there. 
Um, it even includes like a whole list of like outcome measures you can use and that sort of thing. So and, and it helps you think about how to design studies. So if that's something that you're interested in, this is a great place to start. And then if you're writing up research, which is about um, you know, having investigated the outcomes of genetic counselling. This is super cool. So you know how there are like guide up guideline papers for um, reporting randomised control trials and that sort of thing? This is a guideline document for how to report genetic counselling research studies. Okay? Um, this is one of those papers that you... Do you ever have one of those ones that you wish you'd been part of? This is it for me. Yeah. And then if you're a qualitative researcher, um, there's a bunch of papers out there that can be really helpful. Dania's paper on the left here, which is about um, inductive content analysis, which I only learned about for the first time a couple of weeks ago. So thank you, Dania. Um, so that's a great place to start if that's a, a methodology that's of interest. On the top there, you've got a grounded theory introduction from a genetic counselling perspective. That paper's 10 years old or so, but don't let that fool you. There's nothing changed there in terms of its relevance. Um, and then finally, this is just at the bottom right, it's Tasha Weinstein, who you heard talk at two o'clock in the morning her time the other day. Um, and she's just talking about um, a, sort of a broad overview of different types of qualitative methodologies. So I'm done. But what I've talked about is that I think it really matters that we establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility. And to do this, we need to be really clear about our foundational values and our core values uh, core assumptions and defining genetic counselling. We need to conduct and publish high quality research and ensure that this is being shared with and read by people other than genetic counsellors. And we can all contribute. I will definitely do, be doing my part as I take on the role as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Genetic Counselling. I would love for you to join me in, in trying to move this forward. I just want to finish by saying that like, I have really struggled while I've been doing this talk with um, wanting to establish genetic counselling as a legitimate area of study with academic credibility while recognising that that involves buying into the colonial, white, supremacist, patriarchal construct that is academia. And the tension, this is a tension that I haven't really fully resolved for myself yet. Um, but again, I, you know, I showed that quote at the beginning about post-disciplinarity. So I have been back to that um, because the concept that it is good, it's about um, how you can engage or operate within a system while at the same time actively trying to dismantle it. So I think that there's something quite appealing about that to me. Um, but I think it's really important that I just acknowledge that um, to close. Anyway, thank you all so much for your attention and um, I will look forward to discussing if we've got time. Yeah. As always, that did not disappoint. Oh, you, I think you've raised so many thoughts that we're going to have lots of questions, and you've left us with 15 good solid minutes yes. for discussion, which is amazing. I'm going to take the Do moderator's it. perspective and ask you the first one. You talked a couple times just mentioning that we need to get people outside of genetic counselors to yeah. read our work, yeah. but you didn't dig into that so no. much. So I wonder if I can ask you to yeah, elaborate absolutely. on that and then we'll go to questions. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something I struggle with an awful lot, I think. Um, but I, so I think some of it comes from like, we need to do more than just publish in our own journals. Um, so obviously we, it's important that we do that, but we also need to be, you know, I publish a lot in psychiatry journals, for example. Um, you know, I think recommending, when you're submitting a paper to the Journal of Genetic Counseling, we ask you for reviewer recommendations. If we can think of people that have methodological expertise who are not genetic counselors, for example, that can be really, you know, going to conferences that are like, you know, not genetic counselor conferences and presenting your work there. So, you know, and I, one of the things I'm looking into at the moment is, is trying to develop a genetic counseling research podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so with the idea being that it would be for us, but also it would be for, you know, other people outside of our our area. So I think there's a whole bunch of ways that we can do that. But I think it's just, I think even just like explicitly articulating it for ourselves is like the first step in trying to figure that out. Yeah. But I'm sure people have other ideas as well about that, which would also be awesome to hear. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I, let's see who has microphones. All right. We'll go here and then there and then over there. Hi, thank you so much for that. As always, amazing. Um, I am sitting here struggling to think about where I fit into this because I feel I am a genetic counsellor, but most of my research is around education mm -hmm. now. So I feel I'm might tending to go into the other realm now, where I'm perhaps not a genetic counselling research, but researcher, but still always willing to help um, in the in the area. 
I just wanted to pick up on the point that you said around um, reviewing manuscripts, mm -hmm. because I know it is something that can be quite a burden for yeah. a lot of people. In my experience, it's been one of the most beneficial things in doing, because it actually helps with my own writing Absolutely. and actually with my own research. Yeah. But, and I encourage um, people in my team and other people to actually take on that opportunity. But I hear that they just don't know how to yeah, or want yeah. some more guidance in that. And I'm just wondering whether that's anything that you've considered as part of your role, especially in your new role, um, around providing mentorship around reviewing or even just some step-by-step -step guides around that. Yeah, totally. So we do have like step-by-step -step guide on the Journal of Genetic Counselling thing, like that when you get the... Um, invitation to review it actually has like a little outline about how you might think about doing that um, but and we've done workshops in the past about how to review papers and it's not been for a while though to be fair um, but uh, and yes um, so we don't have anything formalized yet in terms of a mentorship program but we have um, past editorial board members who are keen to establish so yeah look for that in the new year it's gonna come Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, one brief reflection on our values and something I think that is a value that we hold to is a commitment to the hybridity of knowledge, the idea that meaning involves bringing different knowledges together. And yes. I think that's something that we take from our clinical work to our research roles really well. Yeah. Um, th the thing I wanted to ask about is um, I found that um, huge value has been got by working with other academics. Yes. And, and um, I've just collaborated with a philosopher who does work on philosophy of empathy and how we define and measure empathy oh, and so tried, cool. to, tried to write that with a genetic counselling perspective. Do you have advice on how we can reach out to other academics and create those collaborations? Oh, well, I mean, should I ask you that question given that you've just done it? I mean... <laughs> well, she was a mate. So it kind of worked. So I can't make friends with every philosopher. I wish I could. Why not? But I, I mean, and so, um, so, so what I have done in the past is like, um, you know, because I've ended up doing, so my PhD is in molecular genetics, and I've ended up doing qualitative research. I've ended up developing, you know, psychometric scales to measure latent constructs and that sort of thing. So I certainly wasn't trained in how to do those things as part of my PhD, let me tell you. Um, so the, the way I've been able to do that is by exactly that, is by forming those relationships and collaborations. And sometimes it's like colleagues of colleagues, you know, that you're talking to somebody about a problem and they're like, oh, you know, this person might be able to help you. And sometimes, honestly, it's been fan personing, right? So you find somebody's paper and you're like, this is super cool. And you get in touch with the author of that paper and, and say, hey, do you think like you know, this is my problem and I was thinking about trying to do this. Would you have any interest in, you know? So I've done that a couple of times to, to great effect. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm currently working, like, I, a few years ago, I didn't know a single health economist and I'm currently working with three, you know, so, it, and I have, zero, you know, prior expertise in health economics whatsoever, but now working with a whole bunch of them because that's, that's where we need to go in terms of looking at questions for genetic counselling. I'm a big fan of reaching out to people whose work you admire and saying, do you want to be friends? Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think Danya wanted to add a comment to this specific point. Before cool. we, we'll, go, we'll come back to Amanda, but I think Danya wants to follow immediately on that. Sorry, Amanda. I just wanted to say, do what you're doing now. Go, go to conferences and yeah. go talk to the people that are speaking that you really you know, gel with. And th I think that's one of the best ways to totally. meet, meet, meet mm -hmm. people. So make sure you get out there and, and yeah, like I think anyone, anyone here would be happy to have someone come up to them and say, what you're doing is cool, let's work together. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Janine, that was awesome. Um, I feel I have a lot to reflect on. Um, one thing, a comment and then a question. My comment is um, you kind of outlined what research, experienced researchers and emerging researchers and educators can do. And I sort of felt like actually much more broadly than that, any, including genetic counselors working in clinical roles yeah. or I wouldn't consider myself an emerging or experienced researcher, <laughs> but feel I have some sort of duty to sort of champion the work that's being done. 
And I don't know if you have any thoughts about how then those, say, even working in clinical services can best do that, because sometimes they might feel like they need to provide evidence to some way to yeah. gain more staff. And the way in which they do that might rely on the outputs from um, the research that you do. Mm -hmm. um, but my main question was around the value about clear communication, which I agree we are so good at. Mm -hmm. And often, I think, people find it very difficult to engage with academic research if they're not academics. Absolutely. Because it's really difficult to... So is there a way that as genetic counselors we can lead the way, and in general researchers are starting to do this like with very easy read abstracts yeah. or visual abstracts, that feels like an area that we're already very good at. Is there more we can do to make our research more accessible to patients or the public who can advocate for us? Yeah. Or is that... I don't know, the cynical side of me is saying is that a bit fruitless because those that maybe are able to further our academic credibility might not care about that so much, I don't know. What yeah, do I, I, I mean, honestly, I think that's critical no matter whether it's going to further our academic credibility or not. Um, you know, the reason that we... The reason that we become genetic counsellors ultimately is because we want to help people in some way, shape or form, right? So we get to do that more immediately and directly if you're working in direct patient care, but it's absolutely what might motivates me as a researcher is that I'm not just doing chin scratch research that's, you know, I, I'm doing research that's about trying to make things better for people. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you want the work to, like if the work is worth doing, I feel like it's worth doing well, and then it's worth trying to communicate it as broadly as you can to make sure it has the intended impact or has the best chance of having that intended impact. So yeah, I, I agree with you entirely, Amanda, on everything. Um, and then I think, um, that the, yeah, to get back to your first point about clinicians, so people who are in direct patient care roles, you know, I, often people do, you know, often people do have journal clubs and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, um, and we think of ourselves as lifelong learners, right? That's a thing that's often in our codes of stuff. Um, so I think it's about, you know, staying on top of things and, you know, um, sharing what you find with colleagues and that sort of thing to the degree that you're able and interested. Yeah. Yeah. Down here in the front, and then we'll go to Adam, and then up here. Oh, okay. sorry, I have the microphone. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to like add a comment to Michelle's question. Um, I recently was invited to review a paper by a previous uh, kind of co, um, a professor that I've worked with, and I received an email from Janine saying like, "This is like, do you need help? Do you have any questions about how to review that?" So just like maybe connecting with your mentors. I mean. They connected with me and you know reach out, but also just like it could be a two-way thing where you know mentees connect to mentors, and that was very uplifting. And I felt like, oh, this is less intimidating, right? I can ask the questions I need to to people that can help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was the first comment, and then my second question, which I'll get a bit personal, um, kind of in the framework of doing research that you're passionate about, um, serving patient populations that you're passionate about. I struggle a bit with that myself because, as some of you may know, I'm like originally from the Middle East, so I identify as Arab Lebanese, um, but I've kind of like left that side of the world and just continue to grow in like the United States, which yeah. has like the most genetic counselors, the most published research about genetic counseling and stuff, and I continue to contribute to that system that is potentially, you know, mostly like white, yeah. cisgendered women, et cetera, which, I mean, I still appreciate and I obviously like, you know, love growing in that space and contributing to my community there, but I struggle with how to like, you know, move that research to the yeah. other side of the world while still maintaining those high quality standards that you mentioned, just because it's non-existent there. Yeah. So, you know, how can I exist while just, yeah, I think you get my question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't uh, like, oh, well, actually, I'm not sure what the question is, but, but I, I, no. I, I reflect, I reflect the, the struggle that you're expressing, and actually, it reminds me, there was something that I had on my notes page that I meant to say, and I didn't, so thank you for the opportunity to correct that. But um, all of that stuff that I was showing you, um, you know, Barb Biesecker's paper, um, Pat McCarthy Veach's paper. So all of this, uh, and you know, me, I'm not a woman, but I'm, you know, I'm a, a white person. And like, it, so it's, it is all very North American centric. I mean, so we, and if, if we are going to have a set of core values um, and foundational assumptions that reflect the genetic counseling profession, 
you know, that in a way that doesn't constrain itself to geographical boundaries, then we really do need to get a lot more broad in in how we're thinking about things and in, include, um, you know, those other voices. And so, yeah, it sort of relates to the talk that we heard earlier this morning. I think as a genetic counselor who's moved from the U.S., I didn't realize how U.S.-centric it was yeah, until yeah. I got away. And, and certainly, you know, when I'm looking at papers, I feel like if you ask the established researchers from the U.S. to be the reviewers of a paper that's from somewhere else, they often don't acknowledge that's all of right. these other that's differences right. yeah. in the state of the profession and the culture and other things and may need some coaching from that's, you as the editor, exactly for right. example, yeah. Yeah. about how to really think about that and also to get reviewers that's from right. the countries yeah. that these papers are coming from, I think is really important to establish that. Yeah. So one of the changes there. that I'm looking to make, this is a sneak peek for everyone, one of the changes that I'm um, looking to make um, for the editorial board when I start in the new year is expanding the board to include people from different geographical regions around the world. Um, and I, you know, I think those sorts of things will help a little, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So in front, and then back, and then there, and then we'll probably be out of time. <laughs> thank, thank you, Janine. That was a, a fantastic talk, and thank you for thinking all those things through for us so we don't all have to go down a rabbit hole. It's really great. Um, but one of the things that I've observed um, from coming from nurses, so nurses now in the UK have taken on much more genetic counselling or aspects of genetic counselling. And, and I was in a meeting, in fact it was the meeting, the G2NA, which is about gen genomics in nursing. Um, and they were talking about the problem with being able to disseminate information about cancer, hereditary cancer, within families and how on earth were they going to tackle this problem. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody was even thinking about or seeing yeah. the research that's already been done, so I chipped in with that bit. Yeah, exactly. But I think it, it brings me to a question which is how do we, in the key words that we put when we're publishing, yeah. is there, do you think there's anything else we should be adding in there? Because mm -hmm. if we put in genetic counselling as a key word, yeah. people are not going to find Obviously, yeah. you might also put in cancer and family communication, but how can we, how can we extend that so people are not missing the, all the good research? Yeah, I mean, th this is this is one of the things that gets me very upset. Is you know, uh, it it affects me the most as far as it goes with psychology. There's so much that goes on in terms of you know risk perception and that sort of thing. I'm like, oh my god, there's this whole body of knowledge over here from genetic counselling that you haven't you know, acknowledged in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah, so I think when you're reviewing papers and that sort of thing, like call it out to make sure people are citing the appropriate things. Um, yeah, keywords, I, I wish there was like a very simple solution, to, but I don't think there is. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has one, but I, I don't. Um, yeah, I, but I think just being aware of it and doing whatever little bits that we each can as individuals to chip away at it is good practice so exactly things like that going to and going hello by the way did you know in terms of family communication genetic counselors have got that you know so yeah yeah keep doing it thanks janine this is wonderful so you've been thinking about this a lot clearly <sighs> yeah and uh, have articulated a need to define the profession uh, in a way that uh, highlights the values uh, academic credibility so where are you going to publish that <laughs> okay. Where, where so, are you going to submit this opinion piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, so um, part of it, um, that first bit about why we need to establish genetic counselling as an academic discipline, if you like, um, I've actually written up as an editorial that's going to appear in the first issue of the Journal of Genetic Counselling when I'm editor. And then the second bit about the... the, the um, the values and definition and that sort of thing, I think I'm going to put into, into a second piece that will hopefully be in the issue following. I guess that's one of the awesome perks of being editor. You can stick your own stuff in there. Yeah. Thanks. Looking forward to reading. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Yes. Um, I would like to say that um, your talk made me realize that why I came to this meeting. So there were all the questions in my mind. They were just oh, appearing good. here. So I would say that I'm a, a researcher in medical genetics and student in the University of British Columbia and uh, uh, Cardiff University trying to become or 
at least I have, I'm feeling something that, that draws me to become a genetic counselor. But uh, I would say that all the research became so big now, everything is multidisciplinary. So uh, you need some people, maybe like me, I mean, some bridging people uh, who believes in the Absolutely. importance of uh, genetic counseling. Uh, so instead of uh, making the research just alone or publishing alone. Mm -hmm. So there are there are some people. I'm thinking that I'm I'm I, first of all I'm I have to bridge my you know, I mean University of uh, Copenhagen with the hospital because they are very good uh, genetic counselors, but the relation is not that good with the university. So I'm trying to if yeah. I can get some of my research towards genetic counseling and work together. And I would say that, for example, I'm an editor in scientific reports, which is multidisciplinary, so I can easily recommend that uh, they make a special issue or uh, if there's a collaborative uh, work, yeah. something like that. So awesome. uh, I felt as if like I wanted to find myself in your talk, but I couldn't. Oh, I'm so very sorry. Yeah. It's not, it's, yeah. I mean, so it is, it is, I mean, you have to accept that you have to become a part of a group. I mean, maybe it's a big project and then one workshop, I mean, work package. I mean, it is, uh, so to become bigger, I think that uh, more collaboration is needed. I yeah, mean, no, I entirely agree. And, you know, sorry if that didn't come across particularly clearly. I, I don't think it was very much the focus, but, I, you know, so when I was talking about if we're working in teams, like I work in teams that are f focused on psychiatry, for example, Kennedy and I have some new work where we're, you know, working with family physicians and that sort of thing. And yeah, I agree entirely that those, those collaborations are critical and that's part of the response that I was trying to give about how do we get people outside of genetic counselling to know about who we are. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually going to ask you one last question okay. before I let you leave. Um, I feel like this conference has been so inspiring and your talk has been so inspiring about the, the profession and the, and the academic component of it. So I wonder if you have any last bits of advice for us about the academic component in our own institutions. And I know we've had lots of conversations about how we all struggle with this, but, but what message would you give our audience about how to springboard from the research to the interactions in our institutions? Oh. oh. And that level of academic respect and credibility. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there, there's a whole bunch of, I think it's just really important to acknowledge that there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on there. You know, those of us that work in, you know, so, okay, so genetic counseling, as we all know, is a profession that is prima, as Jared told us the other day, is like primarily white, primarily women. Um, we, we tend to be younger, um, you know, and, and all of these things set us at a power differential with, you know, the older white male physicians that we often find ourselves working with. Um, and I, you know, so I, people in genetic counseling talk a lot about the concept of imposter syndrome, right? That we don't feel good enough, that we don't feel as valuable, blah, blah, blah. Um, the way that I've come to understand that in more recent years is through, um, the framing that there's Rageshri Dariawan, um, absolutely awesome academic in this country actually, who talked about so I've, uh, the phrases credibility deficit and testimonial injustice mm. almost had the same resonance for me as when I heard the words genetic counselor together for the first time. I was like, I just immediately intuitively understood that credibility deficit is about. Um, the fewer dimensions of being a cis, het, white, able-bodied man you can pass for, the less credibility you're going to have, credibility deficit. Testimonial injustice is that anything I have to say with the fewer of those dimensions I can pass for, like my testimony is not valued as much, right? So, so this is the way that I'm trying to rethink this idea of imposter syndrome. It's disquieting because it means that you know, the, the attractive thing about imposter syndrome is that it tells you that it's your problem and you can fix it, right? The problem with thinking about it as testimonial injustice and credibility deficit is that it identifies the problem as being with the environment. But we can't do anything without acknowledging that that is where the problem is first and foremost, right? So I think that 
you know, if I could, if I could do one thing for this profession about which I care so deeply, it's that I just would like to be able to infuse everybody with like a massive bucket of confidence and knowing what our value is, right? So you can't control how other people will treat you in in those you know environments that we were just talking about the topic of your question, but we can control how we respond to to how people react to us, right? And just because somebody devalues me does not mean I have to devalue myself. You know, I can, yeah, I've got, yeah. My clinic, as many people know, my psychiatric genetic counseling clinic, which I'd nurtured and built for 10 years, was closed um, in June. And um, my initial reaction was to feel shamed and small and that kind of thing, that I was a failure. Um, quickly realized that was all completely back asswards, essentially. And by owning that narrative and sort of standing up to it, I actually come out feeling a lot more powerful than, than, I, than I did for the three years prior when I was fighting to keep it open. So it is very much about like knowing my value, knowing what I have to contribute and not allowing other people to take that power away from me. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that you are leading the fight of good battles and trying to inspire all of us. And I want to thank you for your inspiring talk and hope you'll all join me in that.